I hear from lots of people every day who are concerned about how their diet is affecting their health. They need answers based on facts, in other words, from the peer-reviewed medical literature, and that is what I'm here for. Welcome to the Nutrition Facts Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Greger. Today we answer a wide variety of your questions, like whether or not we should include protein supplements, the potential benefits of niacin in the diet, and the effects of a vegan diet on irritable bowel syndrome. Let's get your questions. OK, uh, first question. 23-year-old, want to build a lot of muscle for sport. Is it healthy to eat 1.5 grams protein per kilogram body weight if it's 100% from whole food plant-based sources? And no point of the daily dozen is missed. So in Hanat age, and the anti-aging literature in general, it really focuses on protein restriction, reducing one's intake down to recommended levels, which would be about half that 0.8 uh, grams for a healthy gram body weight. And that's for a whole variety of reasons, which I talk about. And at high levels of protein, it doesn't matter in terms of, for example, IGF-1 activation, this... Um, pro-aging, cancer-promoting hormone. Uh, at high enough levels of protein intake, doesn't matter whether you're doing animal or, or um, plant protein, you still get a boost in IGF-1. It's only when you're down, down to recommended levels where you get a boost in, um, from animal protein sources, but not from plant protein sources. So I uh, recommend you cutting down. Now I know you say, well, wait a second. Do I have to, uh, is it like, you know, the seesaw? Do I have to like, you know, at the expense of muscles, do I need to, to live longer? I think people really, really overestimate the benefit that they're going to get from uh, muscles in terms of protein supplementation. So, for example, to older men and women, there's no benefit to adding extra protein for muscle mass, muscle strength, or performance. It's just not true. I mean, look at the latest meta-analysis and no statistically significant change, period, across the board. Now, uh, that's not true in younger men and women, middle-aged and young, as this questioner is. Um, but uh, so last I checked, there are 26 randomized controlled trials in middle-aged and younger individuals for adding protein to boost lean mass. And 25 out of 26 failed. 95% failed to show any significant increase in lean body mass. Okay. But enough of them trended in that direction, even though they didn't hit statistical significance, that when you put them all together in a meta-analysis, um, you get, on average, like a 0.3 kilogram, so less than a pound, increase over 13 weeks of an extra 40 grams of protein a day added to a resistance training program. Um, so I think that's a lot less than people think. Um, and, of course, they're looking at lean mass, right? Lean mass can be water retention can be liver inflammation or, or, or kidney swelling, you know. Um, there's actually not a great correlation between changes in lean mass and the gold standard um, uh, measurement of muscle mass, which is uh, muscle mass measured on MRI. And for stats geeks out there, that's an R value of 0.49, which is really weak correlation. So even getting more lean mass doesn't mean what we really care about, which is appendicular. Uh, lean mass, you know, like, uh, you know, thigh circumference or arm circumference, etc. So I would encourage you to um, not overdo it. Next up, what about plant stanols? Yeah, so there's phytosterols and stanols. So there are these cholesterol-like components in nuts and seeds, predominantly, um, that actually kind of fool our body into thinking it's cholesterol. And so they are absorbed, I mean, our cholesterol transporters in our uh, small intestine, but actually aren't cholesterol, don't act as cholesterol, so we're just basically dumped back in the intestine to kind of recirculate. And so actually prevent the absorption of some cholesterol either going in our mouth, or in this case, cholesterol made by our liver, dumped in the intestine to get rid of it if there's not enough fiber to glom onto it, um, or if there's these, these phytosterols and stanols to kind of uh, block those receptor pathways. Um, then they'll just get reabsorbed and you can retain your high cholesterol. So on the portfolio diet, um, which was created um, by one of my favorite scientists at the University of Toronto, Dr. David Jenkins, is the guy who came up with a glycemic index. It's a plant-based diet, but so that cuts down on the big three things that increase your cholesterol, 
which is trans fats, saturated fats, and dietary cholesterol. And that's enough for most people. So if you just do those three things, then, you know, the bell curve is like 68, LDL 68, which is right where we want to be for primary prevention. Uh, but look, it's a bell curve. So some people do even better than that. And some people, because genetic predisposition, are higher, even cutting out those things. And so if you have a genetic predisposition, it's not something to throw your hands up in the air. You, know, you just have to work harder at it. Okay, what are you going to do to work harder if you cut out all the bad stuff? Then it's a matter of adding healthy foods to one's diet that pull cholesterol from your system. Um, and different foods drop your cholesterol using different mechanisms. So Jenkins had this brilliant idea. Let's have a portfolio of different foods that pull cholesterol down from different ways. And so like adding, you know, beans and soy and viscous, soluble fiber, rich foods, like slimy foods, like okra, oatmeal, eggplant, things like that, pull your cholesterol down. Um, and one of the things in the original portfolio diet, I know that's gone through a couple different kind of transitions, was a uh, supplement. I uh, was a, uh, I think the original one was actually a margarine containing um, uh, phytosterols, but uh, you can take it in a supplement form. Um, and that is one mechanism to bring cholesterol down. And he was able to show you can bring cholesterol down within two weeks faster than the statin and as good as a first generation statin, all just with you know, dietary intervention. Now, whether I, I'm not sure what, what role that plays in the current portfolio diet, I actually just pulled uh, last week all the portfolio diet studies. Um, it's about 100 of them. And you know, I realized that, you know, I haven't really done a video about the portfolio diet, the super, you know, well-published, well-researched thing. I've kind of mentioned it peripherally. And so I'm going to do a whole video series um, and we'll see what the current kind of thinking of it is. But um, at the time, that was definitely one of the strategies. And of course, there's all sorts of other things. You know, I talk about black cumin and amla and other things that drop cholesterol. And so we could beef up the portfolio diet although beef up is probably not the right word. Okay, what's next? Um, just discovered they have a renal lesion. How to best prepare for surgery? Oh, that's a good question. You know, one of the things important for surgery is, ironically, just after I talked about how we need to restrict protein, is getting more than just the recommended minimum protein. So for example, people with pressure ulcers heal better at higher protein intakes. Um, it's probably actually still below the average American protein intake. So uh, we tend to get about 70% more protein than we need. But so I forget the pressure ulcer data. I think it was like 1.1, 1.2 grams. Uh, it's a lot of protein, but that optimized healing rates. And so presumably, so on a day-to-day -day basis, it's all about kind of maintaining growth, not accelerating growth. Um, but during times of immune activation, trying to fight off infection, or in terms of wound healing, right? There is a lot of growth that has to happen um, in terms of healing that wound. Same thing with like healing from a tattoo or sunburn, or there's all sorts of times where extra protein might come in handy. So that's something. So if you really are right at the recommended protein intake, I would recommend boosting it for um, the healing process with any kind of major surgery. Next up, okay, whole food plant-based. So basically blood sugar, long-term blood sugar control and uh, um, body mass index, all good, but has some higher LDL cholesterol, certainly than I'd like. Oh, and the question is, should I eliminate nuts and seeds to avoid saturated fat? Well, nuts and seeds actually lower your cholesterol, not raise it. Um, and one nut, walnuts have been shown to actually improve artery function. Um, uh, so I would... I would do the, I would go the portfolio diet route. You can Google that and find out all the foods to add to your diet to reduce it down. Or you can also go on nutrition vaccine or put in LDL and pull up all the other things that uh, can, can drop your cholesterol lower. Okay, next up. Oh, high dose niacin. Oh, I talk a lot about niacin. Uh, so niacin is one of the um, NAD uh, precursors. Yeah, so... It's interesting. So there's, there's some really excellent early data on niacin reducing cardiovascular risk. Uh, the problem is it has this flushing reaction. 
So like a hot flash. Um, and so what the phar pharmaceutical industry did is made an extended release version, which doesn't have that flushing reaction. Fantastic. But it turns out oh, it doesn't appear to have the cardiovascular disease benefits. So all the early studies show nice and benefits. Later studies show no benefits or even worse, actually increasing mortality when added to a statin. Well, that's not good. So, uh, and the flushing reaction is, um, is, is probably benign, like, but it's uncomfortable. So currently, uh, you know, niacin has been removed from all the major guidelines um, because um, all these big trials show that it didn't work. Although, is it because niacin really doesn't work or just the extended release niacin doesn't work? Uh, may increase the risk of diabetes like statin does, statins do. Again, maybe that's just a long release, the extended release version. So, but I, until we know more, niacin would not be my first choice, although there may be um, a few medical niches in which it may still be used. It's not certainly uh, a frontline therapy anymore. Okay. Long time follower fan. I'm all in on the Daily Dozen. For those who don't realize, that's all the kind of things I encourage people to fit into their daily routine. It's kind of an aspirational, uh, you know, message to encourage people to eat the healthiest of healthy foods into their daily life. But RV cooking show is saying, that's just too much food. No, no, that's fine. No, I mean, that's the whole thing. I mean, that's, um, again, we're just trying to crowd out some of the less healthy options. Uh, it's just aspirational. Do the best you can. And look, and if you're, a, you know, some endurance athletes who eats 5,000 calories a day, that's a minimum. You know, you can eat all the healthy plant foods you want. Uh, don't worry about it. Okay. Next up, Michelle says, my post on eggs on Instagram caused quite a stir. Any, any uh, additional information? I might clarify things. The many dissenters. Yeah, you know, there's a checkout program with eggs, you know, and so, you know, every carton sold, a little bit money gets controlled by this government agency to promote eggs. Uh, they do all the you know, same thing with dairy. That's why I like the milk mustache ads and everything comes from National Paramount Beef Association does as well. Um, and so there's just lots of, there's just millions of dollars available to kind of try to convince people eggs are, eggs are good for you. But unfortunately, you know, the largest and longest uh, study on, uh, on dying healthy, NIH, AARP study, found that even half an egg a day associated with increased all-cause mortality after controlling for other factors, meaning living a significantly shorter life. The Harvard studies found that any replacing any um, animal protein, including egg protein, poultry, fish, with plant protein uh, associated with um, significantly longer life, lower all-cause mortality, whether it's the protein itself or whether it's just because it's the most concentrated form of dietary cholesterol, that's probably the number one reason. And even most of the studies, 80% of studies funded by the egg industry show that eating eggs increases uh, your cholesterol. So it's amazing that they're able to kind of spin uh, spin the science the way that they have. But uh, I would encourage people to minimize their consumption. Look, it doesn't matter what you eat on your birthday, holiday, special occasions, on a day-to-day -day basis, really should try to eat healthy which means cutting down on processed foods, meat, eggs, dairy, salt, sugar, maximize their intake of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, beans, peppers, chickpeas, lentils, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, mushrooms, basically real food that grows out of the ground. These are our healthiest choices. Next up, Ocean Parkway for 1949 asks, is the absorption of nutrients from hibiscus tea impacted by soy milk and or banana? Well, maybe banana, right? Because the polyphenol oxidase enzyme. Uh, so we would be concerned that those um, polyphenols in hibiscus tea, which is why we drink it, um, uh, would be affected. However, the soy milk, we don't have data on hibiscus tea and soy milk, but we do have on uh, the chlorogenic acids, the, the beneficial antioxidants in coffee and soy milk. Although they're bound in the small intestine, they're released in the lower intestine um, uh, and so they doesn't impair the antioxidant boost that we get from drinking coffee, um, like dairy milk. Um, so I would assume soy milk would be fine, but that sounds disgusting. Hibiscus, you know, hibiscus tea is, it's like sour and yeah, I don't know, but look, do whatever you want, but yeah, it shouldn't, shouldn't be a problem, but bananas probably would. So 
I would eat your banana separate from your viscous tea if you wanted to get all the nutrition of the viscous tea um, rather than just some of the nutrition. All right. Next up, Caroline. It's safe to eat store-bought frozen fruit straight from the freezer, straight from the freezer without defrosting. Ooh, concerns about potential pathogens. Oh, eat it frozen. Yeah, no, absolutely. Is it safe to eat store-bought fruit? Yeah, no. If you look at my freezer, it's half frozen greens, half frozen berries. And although sometimes I warm it up, put in like oatmeal or something, yeah, you can make smoothies. Found fantastic. Um, yeah, they're washed before they're frozen. Um, and so we shouldn't have to worry about it. Uh, worry about, you know, like uh, getting some like hepatitis A from eating um, uh, frozen fruit. Great. Good question. Okay. JBO says normal cholesterol. Great. Well, <laughs> if you have normal, normal for the human species or normal for a society where normal one causes death and heart disease, but we'll just assume we have a good LDL. LDL. Um, but HDL is too low. That doesn't matter. HDL is not a causal risk factor. Uh, for heart disease, we used to think it was so-called good cholesterol. It actually helped, um, although associated um, with lower risk of cardiovascular disease, it's associated in a way that having ashtrays is associated with getting lung cancer. It's not the ashtrays; it's the uh, you know, it's the uh, the fact that you're smoking. Um, and so I have a whole video about it. Just type in HDL into a nutritionfacts.org, it's going to pop up. It's in some coconut oil uh, or coconut milk video, I think. Um, yeah, so don't need to worry about it. Um, so, yeah, they, it's, it's not a cause of risk factor. We don't worry about it. We care about our LDL cholesterol. Okay. How much, oh, how much, this is a fancy question. Martin says, how much ground mustard, meaning ground mustard seed, like powdered mustard, should we add to frozen vegetables to add back the lost enzymes from the freezing process? So cool. Okay. Um, so it's not the freezing process that kills the enzyme, but it's the heating um, uh, you know, uh, vegetables are blanched before they're frozen to, to, so that they don't rot in the freezer, um, that, uh, inactivate the enzymes, but then how are you going to make your sulforaphane from your glucosinolates for people who are like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, uh, check out my video on nutritionfacts.org where I talk about how, um, you either eat your cruciferous vegetables raw or you hack and hold, you chop them up. Let the enzyme do its job because the uh, precursors and the end product that you're looking at, sulforaphane, what you're interested in, are both heat stable, but the enzyme is not that makes it, that makes that conversion. So you chop it up, let the enzyme do its job, then you can cook all you want. Uh, the problem is uh, the, the frozen vegetables come kind of pre cooked in a way. So you add some enzyme. How do you add enzyme? You add powdered cruciferous vegetable. Mustard greens are a vegetable. Mustard greens come from mustard seeds. Powdered mustard seeds is the spice. So these researchers are like, can we just sprinkle a little mustard powder onto our pre-cooked greens and get all that sulforaphane? Yes. How cool is that? Um, uh, one milligram is almost imperceptible, but uh, uh, just a sprinkle. A little sprinkle that you can hardly even taste. You can watch the video, but I think it was like one thirty-second of a teaspoon or something. which is just like a teeny little... Seen a little sprinkle is all you need. Anyway, okay. Next up, are there any reliable data sources on how a vegan diet can help combat um, uh, uh, the kind of diarrheal component of uh, IBS? Most diets are so limited, have very little effect. Um, so we're talking about irritable bowel. Um, and uh, I do, so I would just type irritable bowel into nutritionbacks.org. Um, it's mostly surrounding about improving your gut flora by eating lots of prebiotics um, uh, to, to tamp down on inflammation because many of the postbiotics made by our good fiber feeders um, uh, have anti-inflammatory action like butyrate. Um, so just, yeah, uh, check it out on nutritionfacts.org. Okay, next up, hydrocephalus, ah, uh, which is kind of too much... Uh, fluid in the brain. Oh, debilitating headaches, pressure, that's not good. So uh, would eating healthy make a difference in pain and symptoms? I've never run across anything uh, that would suggest so. Um, if it gets uh, significantly bad, you, there's, you, you can surgically have a, uh, a shunt implanted for like normal pressure hydrocephalus 
but I have not run across anything. Uh, diet lifestyle. Although I don't think I've ever looked specifically. So don't take that to mean there isn't anything we can do. I've just hadn't run across it. We would love it if you could share with us your stories about reinventing your health through evidence-based nutrition. Go to nutritionfacts.org slash testimonials. We may be able to share it on social media to help inspire others. If you see any graphs, charts, graphics, images, or studies mentioned here, please go to the Nutrition Facts podcast landing page. There you'll find all the detailed information you need, plus links to all the sources we cite for each of these topics. My latest book, How Not to Age, is out now, premiering at number two on the New York Times bestsellers list. Check it out at your local public library. Of course, all the proceeds of the sales of all my books goes directly to charity. NutritionFacts.org is a nonprofit, science-based public service where you can sign up for free daily updates on the latest nutrition research with bite-sized videos and articles. Everything on the website is free. There are no ads, no corporate sponsorships, no kickbacks, strictly non-commercial. I'm not selling anything. I just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother, whose own life was saved with evidence-based nutrition.